Quality management. Let me come back. Let me ask you all right now. Um, McDonald's, highest quality burger in the world. Big Mac. Two all, all beef patties, special sauce. Sometimes lettuce, it is. Right? <laughs> Tomato on a sesame seed bun. It's consistent. When was the last time you had Big Mac? Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I can't remember. I can't remember. Um, All the way in and out for you. So I haven't had that in a long time. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Mom and pop shops. See, those they don't they don't count as as fast food. So you know, I'll tell my wife though. All right. So so um, yes, you're right, right. It's consistent. It's consistent. Here's the idea. If I buy a Big Mac here, borrowing the time will take me to travel. You know, to Tokyo. Uh, my Big Mac's going to be the same. Right, it, same box, same bun. Down to the even the meat will taste the same because they McDonald's only sources their meat from like one or two suppliers, you know, globally. You know, down to the amount of special sauce. We took the human element out of it. It's a little gun, and it's not a gun with pressure, right? So I can't I can't go to McDonald's on Wednesdays at six and my favorite person they they put a lot of special sauce in those burgers. Nope, you you hit the gun, click, and the same little three blobs comes out. Right. So they've made it very consistent. And that's what PMI wants you to recognize that quality is about. It's about meeting the requirements with consistency. And so we can say it's a very low grade burger. But, you know, I can go to there's a joint called Super Duper out here and I can get a, um, you know, uh, uh, free range, no steroids or hormones or RSBT, you know, Kobe beef patty on a gluten free bun with organic arugula and feta cheese. But if I go to the same guy or the same girl every day, same cook, and ask him for my burger to be medium, some days it'll be medium well, some days it'll be medium rare, some days it'll be medium, some days it'll get 13 pieces of arugula, some days it'll get 11, some days it'll get 19, who knows, right? And so for PMI, that's low quality. It might be a very high-grade burger, but low quality. So I'm spending a lot of time here because I want you to really dial that in for the exam. That it has so, so, so PMI is kind of equivalent to Six Sigma. In the sense that, you know, Six Sigma is all about reducing variance in the process, right? Lean Six Sigma, yeah. Well, lean, lean is about optimizing the process, but Six Sigma is just about making sure you don't have any defects or variance in the process. And yes, I, yes. And you're saying PMI aligns with that, the Six Sigma right, on the consistency of, of deliverable, not necessarily whether or not that deliverable is optimized. Correct. Okay. Okay. That, and that's great. When you say optimization, that's great. That's great. Correct. Too. Correct. Correct. But, and, 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 and Chris, John, Dana, like this is this, a, real, a real example that just came into my head. Um, eastern span of the Bay Bridge. So you got the Golden Gate Bridge. You got the Bay Bridge here in, up, in, up in, uh, in Northern California. And they just replaced it about four or five years ago. And there was this huge controversy because of the, the tensile strength of the nuts and the bolts, right? And so um, uh, the idea is that, okay, um, if, I have, if I have a, a, a nut or a bolt that at a certain temperature, it will, not, it will not increase in size or shrink in size, right? If it meets the Department of, of Transportation's minimum requirements, right, I'm within it, right? And so now, as long as I do that consistently, it's high quality. But now I can make a product that, you know, it will expand and it will contract within the grade and it meets its requirements, right? And that's one grade. And I can make one where it, it expands and contracts like this and that's a higher grade, number two. And I can make one like this where it, does, it never expands and contracts. And that's your grade three. And each one, you know, it costs a little bit more. Each of those are high quality. They will perform for PMI. But the idea is that each one has a different grade. And they're really, they're really, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time because they're really specific about it. And they, they're really tricky in the question. So we're going to come up with our plan now. When we get to execution, we'll look at quality assurance or managed quality. And that's all about the process. And then we'll look at quality control when we get to monitoring and controlling. And that's all about the deliverable, testing and inspecting the deliverable. All right. So um, let's jump in. We're going to use a lot of plans documents, EFs and OPAs, specifically EFs are going to be like the government regulations when you're looking at quality that you need to meet. And then the OPAs, your, your company might have a higher standard than what the minimum standard is set forth 
by by the regulations, right? So you got to take that into account too. We'll look at all these tools and techniques of how we gather the information, how we analyze it, how we use that information to make decisions, and then how we can represent that as a picture to folks. And then what our plans are going to be for testing and inspecting products. And the output's going to be a plan. We'll come up with the metrics that we want to capture, and then we may update our approach and we may update some documents. So let's jump in. The first thing that we're going to, that, that, that our goal of this process is the plan. It, it is a subsidiary plan. It is a how, but this plan is a little more detailed as compared to the other subsidiary plans in the fact that it's going to define the standards for the project. It's going to define the objectives that we want to achieve, what our testing policies and procedures are going to be, who's going to do it, right? Roles and responsibilities, how we review those processes. Right, it gets a little bit deeper than, than the other processes. So, um, like what tools, like how we're going to measure. If if you know, if you guys are football fans, you remember the whole uh, Deflate Gate with uh, with Tom Brady and the Patriots. This goes back to quality, right? You can't you can't use a digital gauge here and then an analog gauge there, right? Just right there, right in there. It's different tools. Boom, you're not you're not using high quality. So that's that's what we're looking at with PMI. So our plan is going to describe that. We're going to come up with the metrics and how we verify compliance to it. Are we actually achieving the tensile strength or the drying time? You know, what, what are we actually looking to do? All right. So it's got to be specific and measurable, attainable, relevant, timely, like that deal, right? Your metrics need to be smart. All right. So we'll define these in this process. And they give you some examples here, like number of tasks completed, number of defects is a good one, downtime. All right. These are all quality scores. Okay. We also may update our plan, right, depending on, on our ability or inability to meet the, the quality requirements with consistent consistency and how we look at that from a risk perspective and our ability to actually achieve the scope. We may need to update some of the baselines or some of our approaches. And then we may update some of our documents based on this. We may get some new requirements, you know, for testing or inspecting. We may update the risk register based on, on you know, the probability and impact of a particular uh, uh, deliverable to meet its requirements. So we'll, we may update these documents. These are potential. These may or may not happen, but they are still outputs per se. Uh, update to a plan, update to a document. We'll take the charter, has the success criteria, and so we need to be able to consistently achieve that. It, the scope baseline, we'll take that into account. Scope baseline is... Who's gonna give it to me first? What are the three items? Scope statement. The scope statement. The work okay. breakdown structure and WS dictionary. Good, good. Scope statement, WBS, WBS dictionary. We had the schedule baseline that we just looked at, right? The schedule baseline, that sort of condensed or approved version of the schedule, not your project schedule, not detailed. And then we also saw the cost baseline contains contingency reserves so those are our three baselines we'll take the scope baseline into account here all right other subsidiary plans eefs and opas again could be regulations marketplace conditions or your quality system that your company already has in place any templates for that you know maybe um the, the company could have its own internal auditing uh system or department you know separate from your project team right so it could be an opa that you've got to use their templates and adhere to their standards. Now the tools and techniques of how we would create this plan, we might use benchmarking. We might go out and find some standards for, um, you know, for, for performance and use it as a benchmark to see if we're achieving that. All right, we'll brainstorm or interview folks on what they think we, we should be able to achieve over time. We'll analyze that and look at the cost benefit analysis of that and we'll also look at the cost of quality what's coming up in a second we'll use that information to make the decisions remember multi-criteria right multiple options choose something and then double check your 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 choice we may use flow charts mind mapping any different charts like that root cause di cause and effect diagrams right we may choose some of those we may use some of those in our test and inspection plans So we deep dive into benchmarking, talked about that. We know brainstorming and interviews, 
All right, so we won't um, we won't cover that again. This is pretty straightforward. All right, now here we get to the cost of quality. And cost benefit analysis is the idea that you know if you produce quad products that are of high quality, you have higher satisfaction from your customers and your stakeholders. You have less rework. All right, there's nothing but good that comes from it. So. I want you to see the cost of quality in your head, right? That's this bullet point that I just passed over, right? That says conformance and non-conformance, okay? So now we're here, right? Now we see it here. I need you to see this chart in your head, right? Cost of conformance, cost of non-conformance, split up into preventative and appraisal cost, internal and external failure cost, okay? So the cost to make your product conform Okay. The idea is train everybody on what to do. Document, right? Have a process flow map. Hopefully something out in the open that everybody can see. Give everybody the right tools to do it. And then give them time to do it right. Because these days we're always asking our folks to do more with less. Right? We don't even train them. Just throw them to the fire. So train some folks. Give them a process map. Give them the right tools. Give them time to do it right. They should do things correctly. And that costs money to do, right? And then we got to make sure they did it correctly. So now we got to go and assess it. So when you see appraisal cost, think like, you know, I'm getting my house appraised, right? We've got to inspect the foundation and inspect the, inspect the, the attic, see if there's evidence of, of water stains, right? We want to test the electrical, maybe turn on all the circuits, the vacuum, everything, turn on the, the, the microwave, see if we can pop a cir circuit or test the plumbing, you know, um, turn on the hot water in the showers, flush toilets, see if it burns your back type deal, right? So that, that's, that's the appraisal cost of, of your products. We want to test and inspect it and then destructive testing loss. Automobiles, right? It's the easiest thing to think or even iPads. Right, uh, uh, ten, put it here and then increase the pressure slowly, 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 slowly until it cracks and breaks and see, is it meeting its requirements with consistency? What we do a drop test, one feet, two feet, three feet, that idea. So all of this costs money and all of these are gonna be examples on the exam that you're gonna get. PMI is gonna describe the fact that you and your team have been trying to figure out if this you know, rope is gonna be able to hold its weight and so you've been, you know, putting products on the end of this rope and steadily increasing the weight to see when the rope is going to snap, you know, which of the following is most likely associated with this. And they're going to say cost of conformance, cost of nonconformance, um, risk mitigation. You know, they're going to give you three, three choices. You're going to have to pick the right one. All right. They may even say a cost of conformance, B appraisal cost, C destructive testing loss. And technically speaking, A, B, and C are all right, but C is the most right answer. You see that a lot from PMI too. Well, they'll say, what is the best answer? And they'll give you, you know, three or four right answers and you got to pick out the, the best one. So that's the cost of conformance. That's what we do, money that we spend. And if you remember when we were estimating cost, we took this into account. So now that we're doing this process, we're actually going to go back and update our cost estimates to take into account that, well, we've got to pay to train people and give them the right tools and, and we got to might to destroy some things, all right? So that's what we see there. Then we get the cost of non-conformance, all right? So what happens when things don't work? So earlier I gave you the example of, okay, so we're making this a best dry erase marker, right? So if it doesn't work, well, then we rework it. And watch out for this on the exam. We don't fix things, we don't make it right, Right? We don't do it over, we rework it. Same thing with scrap. We don't put it in the garbage, we don't throw it away, we don't get rid of it, we scrap it. So make sure that when, you're, when PMI describes something in the A, B, C, or D, you choose the very official PMI sounding term. All right? Don't choose, oh, we, we, you know, they'll describe some scenario where you or the team you know, are, are, are getting rid of all of the extra waste from your destructive testing loss. So they're talking about this, making you think it's about appraisal, giving you a whole description about that. And then they'll turn around and say, um, uh, the products that you guys got rid of, uh, what is this an example of? Right. So the, the whole time they're describing appraisal costs and then turn around and ask you, what did you, you know, the, the stuff that you're throwing away, what is that? And it's an example of an internal failure or scrapping. Or they'll say, they'll describe the fact that the team, you know, got rid of it. And then they'll say, what, is, what did the team do with that material? 
A, the team got rid of it. B, the team dumped it. Like literally, word for word, they'll put that in. The team dumped it. And you might pick B. And they'll, it'll say C, the team scrapped it. And you have so make sure you pick that, that term. All right, I'm harping on that because that, that happens a lot to folks. You know, they'll, they'll pick the, the sexy answer is A, but then the right answer will be like C or D. So take your time and read all four uh, options. And then external failure cost, you know, um, liabilities is that's going to court. So on the exam, you'll see that described in scenarios where, um, you know, because of the project team's failure to take into account, like, you know, um, let, let's talk about the automobile industry since we've been talking about that, um, you know, a Toyota, like the accelerator, you know, and now there's a class action lawsuit. This is an example of, in that case, it's a liability. You may be liable to pay a bunch of funds to people because of your product, right? Um, they'll describe the fact that, um, you know, um, you're spinning up a system. You work for like Kyocera or Nokia or something, and you've spun up a, a place to receive damaged phones and ship out a new phones to, to your customers. And I'll describe this whole support system and how people can send it in. And I'll say, what's an example of that? That's warranty work, right? Or people stop buying from you. So you got to see this chart in your head. The majority of your questions come from the executing process group. In the executing process group, we have quality assurance. In the monitor and controlling process group, that's where the second most of your questions come from, you get quality control. That's where we're talking about appraisal cost. Quality assurance is where we're talking about preventative cost. Quality control, the result of that will be in either rework or scrapping. And then your testing results will, will determine your external failure cost. You're gonna get a ton of examples that start somewhere here and ask you a question there. It begins here and it starts there. So I want you all to have a very good, you know, solid grasp of what it means for your products to conform or not conform, meaning preventing it and appraising it, or it failing internal or external, and then you know how that how that translates into either change control that we'll see later or updating uh, approaches like management plans, updating documents like test test uh, test scripts, things like that. All right, so this is a really important slide. Do, you know, uh, uh, dog ear this slide or flag it in your book. See this in your head. And in terms of tools and techniques of creating this plan, we're going to need to, you know, a picture says a thousand words. So these are just other ways that we can, you know, show reasons why we need to use a, a particular testing uh, pattern or, you know, testing cycle or something like that. So we may use flow charts. We may use a logical model, you know, UML, something like that. Or we may use a matrix diagram. So, you know, these are, these are um, the tools and techniques you'll see. Just flow charts. Even though there's a whole myriad of them, the answer will just be flow charts, right? They're not going to ask you about a specific type of flow chart, just flow charts, logical data model, or matrix diagram. All right. We may use decision making. We will use decision making, actually, to figure out how we're going to test and inspect and how we rank you know, issues, how we come up with uh, the, the metrics. And what are test and inspection planning, right? That's a, that's a tool and technique, test and inspection planning. So notice sort of the, the verb, the, the action taking place here. Okay. So before I get to the case study, I just wanna, I'm gonna come back real quick and, and you know, if you look at, let me get to a slide where it has the, so far I hope you guys are catching on to the fact that most of the time outputs are documents a plan, a metric, a baseline, a register, a matrix, right? One of these things, right? Um, techniques, tools and techniques are usually actions or activities that we're doing. We're gathering data, analysis, making decisions, representing the data, planning to test and inspect, meeting with people. So you're going to get questions on exam to talk about, you know, a particular process. And it says all the following except which is a tool and a technique of this process. Now, I, I, I want to give you guys this, this information because you do not need to memorize all the tools and the techniques and all of the outputs for this exam. There's no need to do that. There are plenty of people that do, and there's plenty of people that feel like it's necessary. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you can start to just decipher how we're taking action and activities here 
and it's either a document that's an output that typically becomes an input to some other process. So if you know the outputs, you by default know all the inputs anyways, because with the exception of the charter, where we take business case and stuff as an inputs, every other process from identified stakeholders and on takes the outputs from the previous processes as inputs to their processes, right? So if you know all the outputs, you by definition know all the inputs, all right? So if you know the difference between these two, when you get questions like that, then you just got to determine, you know, am I planning, am I executing, am I monitoring, controlling, and then am I, am I talking about scope, schedule, budget, quality, resources, communication, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the value of memorizing the processes. All right, so I wanna give you this nugget now before we get to the case study and so that you can continue to see the relationships here because that's the key to passing the exam, all right? I want, you to give, I want you to know this. All the other stuff you're gonna memorize, you're gonna read, you're gonna take past exams, but, but I want you to understand like how, the, how these questions are gonna be presented.